Hi everyone and welcome back to another YouTube video. So this time we are looking at Unit 19, um, which should be on page 93, I think, with your first questions on 95. Okay. So a few learning outcomes for you here. So we are going to know the importance of person-centred approach when we're working with individuals with a learning disability. We are going to know the main causes of a learning disability. We are going to understand the importance of having effective communication for an individual with a learning difficulty. Okay. What is a learning difficulty? What is a learning disability? So a learning disability is a reduced intellectual ability and difficulty with everyday activities. So it's having difficulty with several different activities. This could be having difficulty with household tasks, having, dis having difficulty with socialising, having difficulty with managing their money. And this will affect somebody for their whole life. So it's not something that's going to change over time. It is something that is going to continue to affect them throughout their life. So that definition of learning disability comes from MENCAP. And the MENCAP website has lots of different resources for you on there. So if you'd like to have a look at that, you can go to www.mencap.org.uk. So just in case you're not sure, that is spelled M E N. C A P. Okay. So then we're going to have a think about the causes of those learning disabilities. So there are lots of different causes for um, a learning disability. Um, a learning disability could be caused by a genetic difference. Um, so it could be a genetic condition, sort of one of the more common ones that we see day to day is Down syndrome. So Down syndrome affects a person in many ways, um, both physically and in their learning as well. Um, so Down syndrome is an example of a genetic condition um, associated with a learning difficulty. Uh, global delay. So. I know that I've certainly used this term whilst doing other videos on here. So global delay or global development delay. Um, it's an umbrella term and essentially what it looks at is a development delay of a children's either cognitive or physical development. OK, so it could be that a baby is not meeting their correct milestones. So they may be are not able to sort of walk or talk by the sort of ages of three or four. So that's where sort of medics and, and doctors and nurses and things are getting that bit concerned, you know, no more is it gonna be, oh, they'll catch up, Every, everyone develops in their own time. It's where they're gonna start those investigations of, right, okay, something maybe isn't right here. Let's see what support we can put in place. Uh, biological factors is another one. So biological factors um, could be the fetus has been exposed to something in the womb, such as alcohol, so fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, it could be that they've been exposed to drugs in the womb as well. Um, these, these differences uh, in pregnancy, taking alcohol, taking drugs throughout the pregnancy, can have a significant effect on a child and they can get a learning problem or a disability from that. Um, now it's not 100% of the cases, um, just because somebody has taken drugs or just because somebody has drunk throughout their pregnancy, it doesn't mean it's 100% guaranteed that that child will have a learning disability and likewise it doesn't mean that the person with the learning disability has it because their parent drank or took drugs throughout the pregnancy. Okay. Um, the next one says damage to the brain before, during or shortly after birth. Okay. 
So a friend of mine, I've spoken her about her a few times on here, she has cerebral palsy and the reason that she has cerebral palsy is because she was born at 28 weeks. So her mum didn't know that she was in labour. She walked to her own mother's house, so my friend's grandpa grandparents' house, um, to ask for some advice. She wasn't sure what was going on. By walking so far, um, she brought on the labour without realising that she was in labour. And obviously there, my friend was born at 28 weeks. Um, so her brain was affected because when she was born, she was born without breathing. It took some time to bring her back around. And as a result of that, obviously the trauma of her birth, um, the early presence of her birth as well. Uh, she has a disability, albeit it is more physical for her, but cerebral palsy can be a learning disability as well. It can affect cognitive development. Um, some learning disabilities could be inherited. So if somebody has a learning disability and they reproduce children, um, there's a chance slightly higher than others um, that that child be born, will be born with a learning disability. Um, illness, illness in sort of early years of life or illness whilst in the womb. The mother may be ill whilst the baby is in the womb. This can affect uh, the brains of the child of the fetus, which again can cause a learning disability. Uh, the last one says, as a result of illness of the mother during pregnancy or in early years due to abuse. So if we think of it, you know, in terms of the brain, um, where learning takes place, if the brain is affected through trauma or through abuse, um, be it that there's a lack of oxygen to a certain part of the brain or perhaps somebody's been sort of hit and they've banged their head and they have hit the floor and fallen unconscious, you know, we don't know what's going on with the brain at that moment in time. Um, so yeah, lots of different causes of learning disability there as well for you. So I wanted to sort of cover that part first before we sort of go into first question really so your first question is on page 95 okay and it's question 62 so 62 says outline why it is important to recognize and value an individual with a learning disability as a person first give four examples of how to use person-centered approach when working with individuals with a learning disability so i thought rather than going straight in with that question that it was probably more beneficial for me to explain a little bit more about learning disabilities and have a bit of a chat with you there about that before we sort of drop in um, straight into that question. Okay. So when we're thinking about the person-centred approach um, for somebody with a learning disability, okay, um, your question says, why is it important to recognise and value an individual with a learning disability as a person first? So it could be that you're working with somebody with autism who perhaps doesn't react in the same way, doesn't smile, doesn't make eye contact, um, doesn't communicate in the same way that sort of, you know, your, your peers might communicate with you. Um, so it's important to remember in terms of valuing somebody, um, and recognising them as a person before that disability, that first and foremost, they are protected by law. So that's your first point that you're going to make. So they are protected by law. OK, so we looked at those laws previously. We looked at the Care Act. We looked at the Equality Act and we looked at the Human Rights Act. In terms of viewing that person before their disability, OK, it is really important to say a person with a learning disability, a person with a disability, a child with autistic spectrum condition, an adult who uses a wheelchair. And we need to try and avoid saying a disabled person, an autistic person, a wheelchair user, because those terms just brand somebody and label somebody before you even recognise them as a person first. So it'd be like me saying, you know, about sort of different hair colours. Oh, um, I would rather say the girl with the black hair, um, the boy with the blonde hair, the girl with the short haircut, rather than saying the short haired girl, the black haired girl. It, maybe that's not the best example. 
um, but certainly it works with sort of colours of skin, if you think about it that way. You know, you certainly don't want to be called the black girl, the brown girl, the white girl. It's still, you know, you can see how that could be deemed as offensive. You know, the girl with the white skin, um, for myself, I would feel much more comfortable with that rather than being called a white girl. I feel like it categorises me unnecessarily. So there are lots of negative effects of labelling, okay? If we use the label before the person, then we are taking away who they really are. So if we say the wheelchair user, the deaf guy, oh, him over there, what's his name? Oh, I don't know, he's, he's the one, uh, mm, he's got hearing aids, yeah? So although you are describing that person, you are inadvertently offending them. I've put some other examples on the PowerPoint there, you know, just to emphasise why labelling is bad. You know, if you think about it in terms of sort of bullying behaviour, sort of, you know, in terms of perhaps school, um, the fat one, the ugly one, the geek, all of those terms are just not very nice. And it's the same or it should be viewed the same way when you're working with somebody with a disability or a learning disability. Other labels that people get called, um, racist, uncooperative, stupid, the idiot. If you call someone naughty, so if you call a child naughty, they can begin to think, that must be me, I'm naughty. I'm not, I'm not Michaela anymore, I'm, I'm naughty. That's who I am. Most people would rather just be called by their name. So rather than calling somebody the wheelchair user, the girl with autism, the autistic girl, you know, although yes, we're still putting the, uh, the person before the disability by saying the girl with the autistic spectrum disorder, it would be much nicer if we just said, oh, she's called Michaela. That helps people to feel much more accepted, okay? So when we think about that person-centred approach, um, we are thinking about it in terms of inclusion, which we looked at quite a lot in Unit 5 when we looked at equality and inclusion. So people are able to be part of their own plan of care so they can share their likes, their dislikes, their needs and their wishes, their preferences, their beliefs. That could be things from, you know, in terms of like food, it could be religion, drinks, clothing. But it gives them an empowerment. It makes them feel like they're in control of their care. As long as they're safe and happy, that's what matters, isn't it? If the care that they are getting in relation to how they wish their care to be meets a standard of care expected by your organisation, then does it really need to be in the same routine as everybody else? Do they need to wear the same clothes as everybody else? Do they need to celebrate the same religion and eat the same food as everybody? Probably not. So we looked at person-centred care previously as well. We said about using their name. We said about it encourages their independence. We said it allows them to grow their existing abilities. So rather than focusing on the disability, you are focusing on the abilities and how you can grow those abilities. So for example, learning how to cook a meal and maintaining their own safety whilst doing so. You know, you can you can see that, you know, perhaps, yes, a knife is dangerous, but can they use it supervised? When I worked with people with learning disabilities, I worked with young adults who were just learning sort of independent skills in their own homes. Um, they were able to use knives and things to cut up veg and um, but you've just got to be sensible with it, you know. If you think about cutting up veg, say a piece of broccoli is a lot softer to cut up than say a carrot or a swede. It's just about making those risk assessments, which we looked at in health and safety, to make sure that we are catering for their independent skills and not over risk assessing whilst maintaining that level of person centred support. So person-centred care plans when you are working in care whether it's with children whether it's with adults 
you need to make sure that you're asking the parents or that child what it is that they want okay what is their favorite toy to play with what's their favorite food what's their favorite drink who's you know who's their best friend what's their favorite color there are so many ways that they can be sort of in charge of their care you can ask their families for more help you can ask the carers and friends and partners um who are around them the, the most about what it is that they can they can get So it, why is it important in planning care? So we need to take into account their needs, their wishes, their likes, their dislikes, and that way we can find things out. What's going to trigger them? Perhaps, you know, they don't like going to a pub, but they don't mind going to a cafe because they don't like the smell of beer or they don't like being around too many people. Routines, what are they used to doing? If they change things, is it going to have an adverse effect? And what are their preferred methods of communication? How can we communicate with this person? So what I would like you to do is to start with A, outline why it is important to recognise and value an individual with a learning disability as a person first. So I've obviously talked quite a lot so far about what that question should entail okay so I've said far too much for you to squeeze into that box but I don't want you to feel that um that you missed out on sort of the lesson that we would usually have planned in the classroom um so I've got an example written here so I'll just have a look at this so it is really important to recognize and value an individual with a learning disability as a person first to show that you respect them to show that you recognize them as an individual which will prevent them from feeling labelled. Okay, so you can pause that there. What I don't want you to do is to copy that right out as I've just said it. I want you to use the information I've given you to come up with your own answer as well. So you can pause now. For B, it says, give four examples of how to use the person-centred approach when working with individuals with a learning disability. OK, and that sort of goes back to where I spoke about sort of differences and um, using their preferred name. So if you've got a child called Daniel, but he's always been called Danny or a child called Robert and he's always been called Bobby, you know, call them by their preferred name. That is such a key, simple one. If you are working with a child and they have a learning disability, you've got to make sure that they are included in the activity whilst taking into account the differences that they may have. So this could be, you know, getting them to try and join in with, say, an exercise video. Um, if, you, if that's what you're doing, I'm thinking about the Joe Wicks PE in case you're wondering where that came from. Um, so it could be that, you know, the, the child wants to enjoy and try and get involved with that sort of PE session that Joe Wicks is doing on his YouTube channels every morning. But a, a child with a learning disability might sort of struggle with some of the moves, um, especially without a mirror to maybe see what they're doing. So it's about adapting those moves, um, but still allowing them to be included Another approach to person-centred care, asking. So ask that child, what is, what is it that they want? Perhaps they're not in the mood for rice and chilli con carne that you've given them for lunch and they're not very happy about it. Instead of saying, but you must eat this, this is what we've given you, why don't you ask what they fancy? Maybe someone opposite them's got fish fingers and chips and that looks like a better deal. Um, encouraging their independence. So allow them to become more independent and you can do that through encouragement and you can do that through allowing them to showcase their skills, allowing them that bit of independence where you can sort of, you know, obviously you're going to risk assess, but you can see what their abilities are so that you can work from them. Ensuring that people still have their rights. So going back to sort of your Equality Act, your Care Act, your Human Rights Act, making sure that the children have their rights or the adults have their rights cared for. Okay, so I've given you lots of examples there actually. So if you can give me four, 
for B in those four boxes provided, that will be great. So you can pause this video now. Okay. So your next question is 65. It says, identify the impact of effective communication on the lives of individuals with a learning disability. If you're unsure of the word impact in the question, think of how could communication help the individual? So when we're thinking about the effects of good communication for somebody with a learning disability, what we're thinking about, it goes back again to the inclusion, okay? If a child is able to communicate, they're able to feel included, they're able to tell staff what they like and what they dislike, they're able to make friends. So this is going to help in so many ways. It's going to make them feel more confident. It's going to give them an identity because they can have an opinion. They can share their ideas. So it is enabling them and empowering them to feel respect. It helps them to show their understanding of the outside world or the learning material that you've given them. It helps them to show that they understand the game that you're playing which in turn helps them to show that they are learning and it helps you to see their learning as well. So if you start your question 65 with communication could help an individual with a learning disability because, and I'll just give you a moment to write that in, so pause here. And then for 66, it says, outline why it is important to use language that is appropriate for age and ability when communicating with a person with a learning difficulty. So I want you to try and imagine for a moment, can you imagine not being able to read the work that you've been given? Can you imagine not being able to tell somebody about your day? Can you imagine not being able to find the words that you wish to say? Can you imagine opening your mouth and no words coming out? Can you imagine what it would be like if the words came out but they were just jumbled up and made no sense? Can you imagine if the sounds that you made weren't the sounds that you meant to make? Can you imagine trying to say something and then someone else just jumping in and saying, oh, I know what you're trying to say. It's this, isn't it? What if that person's wrong and they've just interpreted it? What if people assume that you want something without actually checking that you do because there's no way to communicate with you? What if you cannot hear the questions that are being asked? What if you're not able to see or not able to understand the signs and symbols around you? We see signs and symbols every day when we're allowed to go out, like road signs. Not understanding the words, phrases or expressions of others. So not only not understanding the, the spoken language, but that expressive language as well. Can you imagine not being able to write down your ideas or being unable to join in a conversation? Can you imagine if someone is not waiting long enough for you to respond in some way so that they assume in that you're having nothing else to say to them so they walk away before you've had a chance to get your words out? And that's what it's like for people that have a communication difficulty, okay? So in terms of your question, outline the important, outline why it is important to use language that is appropriate for age and ability when communicating with individuals with a learning difficulty, what you've got to think about is, it's not just can they hear you, it's not just can they see you, it's everything else that comes with it because the problem might not be with their eyes or their ears, the problem is inside of their brains because it is a learning disability. So in terms of communicating with somebody, you've got to think about your tone, you've got to think about your body language, and you've got to think about your voice. Of course, you've got to think about those things, but you also need to think about the words that you are using. So to communicate effectively with a person with a learning disability, you need to use accessible language, 
okay? So when we looked at the Equality Act of 2010, it said that we have to make reasonable adjustments to make life accessible for people with differences. So that's where this accessible language is written in law, okay? So accessible language, what does that mean? So it means avoiding jargon, avoiding long words that might be hard to understand. So in terms of jargon, if I said to you, how are you today, my pets? You might think, oh, what on earth is she talking about? But you are my employability, pre-employability trainees, PETs. You need to avoid long words that people may not understand. You need to be prepared for using different communication tools. You need to follow the lead of the person that you are communicating with. Perhaps they're too tired to talk to you right now. Perhaps they're hungry. You know, there might be other distractions in the room. If they're not willing to communicate with you right now, it doesn't mean that you give up forever. We just find a more suitable time and place. You also need to make sure that you go at their pace. Okay. So when you're thinking about answering that question for 66, why is it important to use language that is appropriate for age and ability when communicating with individuals with a learning disability? So how I'd like you to start your answer is by saying it is important to use language that is appropriate for age and ability when communicating with individuals with a learning disability because, okay, and what I'd like you to do is bring some of those examples in. So you can pause this video now. Um, because that's an outline, I'm looking for sort of two to three sentences there in a paragraph, no bullet points. Okay. Okay, so for question 67, it says, give at least four examples of different methods of communication that can be used where individuals have difficulty with spoken language. So previously we talked about Makaton. So Makaton is a very basic version of sign language. It tries to match the symbols up to the words that are spoken. Um, there is a video on Makaton, which is inside of the autism unit. So you should have already seen that once you're up to this point. If you haven't, I do recommend you take a look. We'd normally do that as a class exercise to break it up a bit. And it's really quite fun. It's a brilliant YouTube channel. She does lots of videos. So Makaton is a great way to communicate with somebody with a learning disability. Because you are saying the word at the same time as doing the sign, the child may pick up the word at the same time as the sign, or they may pick up the sign and then gradually be able to try and say the word. So you are enhancing their communication skills in a couple of ways with that. Another way is to use British Sign Language. Now, I'm not trained in British Sign Language. You can do degrees in British Sign Language all the way up to sort of level six, level seven. Um, it is a recognised language in the UK, um, but you would need to be a specialist to be able to use that. Signs and symbols. So we looked previously at communication boards when we did unit four for communication. Um, we can also think about communication passports and um, objects of reference. So that could be like a picture of a toilet with the word toilet next to it, a picture of um, a food or a fork or something to symbolize food with the word lunch next to it, a drink, you know, a, a cup with some water in to symbolize a drink um, and as that child is pointing and using their hands to communicate with you um, on the paper or on the um, maybe it's cards or wood or something like that where it's printed um, you are able to understand what they want and again if you repeat the word back to them they may start to pick up some language skills spoken language skills as well there are others which are sort of a little bit more simple things like drawing or writing and um, if a child can read and write then they can write things down for you drawings so they could draw pictures or you could draw pictures as well 
um, pointing at objects around the room, so like behind me, door, window, light. <laughs> Using equipment, so computers are sort of a lot more advanced um, in terms of the software that you can, can get. Um, it obviously depends on your place of work and what's available, but that's another way. But also don't discount eye, eye contact because eye contact is a way of communicating. You know, um, certainly if you're working with somebody um, who's had a stroke, you know, you see it on TV or someone who's paralysed where, where they say blink once for no and twice for yes and things like that. Um, I don't know how you'd necessarily work it. Again, you'd have to base it on that individual that you're caring for. So I've given you, I think, eight examples of communication methods for people with learning disabilities so if you can just write them in a sentence like you know pointing or using hand gestures can help with communicating with non-verbal individuals using makaton is a great way of communicating non-verbally whilst st still saying the words it's just to, just to show you understanding a bit more there if you can just write them in a sentence each so i'll just give you a chance to write up 67 there and i think that is the end of this video so it is quite a short unit that you've come a long way to this point um, and this really is sort of summarizing everything that you've covered so far from person-centered support from the laws that we looked at and the rights of the individual and those communication methods so it's kind of about putting into practice all those skills that we've sort of covered already Okay, so you can end, I think I'm going to end this video here. Um, thanks for watching.